Hi, welcome to Lesson 5, Unit 11, The American Civil War. As always, let's kick things off with the hook question. When the Union first began blockading southern ports, how many modern ships did they have to enforce it? At the time, when they were trying to blockade ports, the southern coastline was 3,500 miles long. So how many ships do you think they had in 1861, right when the war began, to blockade those ports and prevent traffic from going in and out of those ports? It was only 35 ships. You can imagine if there's only 35 ships, ships uh, patrolling 3,500 miles of coastline, the blockade originally was not very good, and you would be absolutely correct. Ships like this blockade runner, uh, which is dubbed the Robert E. Lee, were able to travel through the blockade relatively easy early on in the war. Blockade runners were fast and sleek and small. They had uh, telescoping um, uh, smokestacks, and they actually dumped all of their steam underwater so that uh, no steam stacks could be detected above water, which is really, really a cool innovation. This particular blockade runner made it through the blockade 14 times before finally be, be, uh, getting caught on its 15th journey out to the Bermuda Islands, where a lot of tradesmen sold southern cotton and then bought goods that they would then bring back into ports in Charleston and elsewhere in the South. Uh, and they made a killing when they did so. So initially, the blockade wasn't very good. But by the end of the war, about 500 warships were involved in the blockade. And they became very, very good at spotting blockade runners. By 1865, uh, two out of every one blockade runner made it out. And overall, the blockade was relatively effective. It really cut trade in the South down. It really did uh, limit the amount of goods that the Southerners were able to get. The reason why blockade runners would make these kinds of risks. Um, they made a lot of money. If you've ever heard of the movie Gone with the Wind, it's actually one of the most popular movies ever made, period, of all time. In fact, I would argue that it's probably the most popular movie ever made. Um, the number one film. You have the protagonist, Scarlett, and her lover, a guy played by Clark Gable. The guy played by Clark Gable who is looking sternly into Scarlett's eyes and face in this picture, made his millions as a blockade runner. And he was able to make so much money because if you're providing the supply and there's an enormous amount of demand and there's a limited amount of goods, you can basically ask whatever price you want and people would be willing to pay it. So that was the first part of Winfield Scott's Anaconda plan, the blockade. Second part of the plan was taking control of the Mississippi River and splitting the Confederacy in half. By 1862, the North was pretty close to actually accomplishing this. First, Ulysses S. Grant made some major gains in the Western theater of the war after his battle at Shiloh. Remember the battle where people's wounds were glowing? Well, after this battle, he took over pretty much the Northern Mississippi River. Earlier in 1861, a guy named David Farragut, a Naval officer, sailed down to New Orleans conquered the city and established a Union outpost there. So the Union now has control of the south of the Mississippi and the north of the Mississippi. Still, in 1862, the south retains control of the middle of the Great River. They've holed in at a place called Vicksburg, and it would take a year before the Union took over Vicksburg and gained control of the Mississippi River. Meanwhile, all the major fighting is taking place in the East because we've already covered the blockade and we've covered the second part of the Anaconda plan, taking control of the Mississippi River. But the third piece of Winfield Scott's plan was take Richmond. Most of the battles in the Civil War took place in Virginia between Washington, D.C. and Richmond, Virginia. Who was going to be the general who was tasked with taking Richmond, Virginia after the disastrous defeat at Bull Run in 1861? It would be none other than George B. McClellan. George B. McClellan and Ulysses S. Grant are the two major Union generals that I want you to know in this unit. They couldn't be more dissimilar from each other, and you can actually tell it just by looking at this picture. George B. McClellan is staring off in the middle distance, standing tall and proud with a perfectly, uh, uh, perfectly wearing his suit. His buttons are immaculately buttoned. He, is, uh, he looks quite like a general. Then there's Ulysses S. Grant, who basically looks like he grabbed a coat, a general's coat, and put it on right before taking this picture. His pants are ill-fitting. He's not buttoned up. He's 
a very different kind of leader. George B. McClellan was the general's general. He was uh, first at West Point. He was uh, very, very well, um, well versed in military tactics. Ulysses S. Grant almost failed out of West Point, and he was just a rough and ready, tough guy. Um, George B. McClellan always wore the uniform of a general. Ulysses S. Grant would often wear the uniform of a private, which is the lowest rank in the Union Army. Um, today, what we're going to do is we're going to analyze the character of George B. McClellan as it relates to the earlier campaigns to take Richmond in the war. Specifically, we're going to begin to answer essential question number two, compare and contrast the leadership of George B. McClellan and Ulysses S. Grant, who was the better general. Now, we're going to talk a lot about George B. McClellan, and we're not going to talk a lot about Ulysses S. Grant in this lesson, but by the time we're done, you're going to be able to tell who was the better general. Okay, so this video that I have posted here is kind of a joke. It's uh, supposed to be a bunch of letters that uh, McClellan wrote to his wife. In honesty, they, I'll be honest with you guys, since you weren't in my class, they're joke letters. They're written by a comedian. And what they do is they really kind of paint a, an exaggerated portrait of George B. McClellan. I would check them out anyway, because the letters are pretty funny. Um, I, and as always, I'm posting these slides on Classroom right below this lesson, so you can access this video there. What you'll learn when you read this video, or when you listen to this video, is that McClellan was an ego, egomaniac, that he had ambitions to be president, that he really felt that he was the bee's knees. And they didn't have a very high opinion for Ulysses S. Grant or for Abraham Lincoln, his commander-in-chief. This is an actual quote from George B. McClellan. I seem to have become the power of the land. I almost think that were I to win some small success now, I could become a dictator or anything else that might please me. This guy really, really, really has some high ambitions. He kind of reminds me of Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana in a sense. Another characteristic of George B. McClellan that is more important for our purposes. Yes, he was an egomaniac, but he was also a very cautious egomaniac. This is a picture of somebody from the South who's goofing off with a fake wooden cannon that was set up in the South to look like a real cannon. The idea was folks in the South knew that George B. McClellan was a bit of a coward and very overly cautious and that the best way to prevent him from attacking was to make their army seem larger than it actually was. So Robert E. Lee had his men cut down these fake cannons and set them up all over the South in, in protection of, of Richmond, the capital. And McClellan, the theory went, would look at these cannons, think to himself, oh my gosh, the South has enormous artillery pieces. I can't dare attack now. And to be perfectly honest, these kind of tactics actually worked. So much so that it really irritated Lincoln. This is what he said about McClellan. McClellan led the Army of the Potomac, by the way. It is called the Army of the Potomac, but it is really only McClellan's bodyguard. If McClellan is not using the Army, I should like to borrow it for a while. Sick burn, Abraham Lincoln. So a great example of McClellan's military cautiousness was the Seven Days Battle. This is the first time that McClellan tried to invade and take over Richmond. And it was really his only time doing so. So we have two generals here, McClellan for the north and this guy on the right-hand side for the south. If you don't recognize this guy's face, his name is Robert E. Lee. He's probably the most famous general in American history, period. And he's fighting for the South with uh, some, some soldiers to protect him. McClellan has 100,000 soldiers, and Lee is outnumbered at 90,000. But you can imagine that McClellan probably imagined he was outnumbered himself. In fact, he did imagine that he was outnumbered. He was very, very cautious during these battles. These battles were very brutal. 36,000 casualties took place during this time. But it's important to note that... Robert E. Lee suffered twice the casualties that McClellan did in these battles. But McClellan failed to recognize the fact that Lee was losing. Robert E. Lee also, of these seven days battles, only achieved one tactical victory. So, most historians agree that if McClellan had pushed on towards Richmond and had actually fought aggressively, he could have defeated Robert E. Lee in 1862 and he could have ended the war after only a year. Did McClellan do this? Did he fight aggressively to destroy Robert E. Lee? No. Instead, he told his men to retreat. 
Seven Days Battle made the North feel absolutely terrible about themselves. It was an utter catastrophe. People were shocked. This quote from Charles Francis Adams really captures this mood. The air of this city seems thick with treachery. Our armies seem in danger of utter demoralization. Everything is ripe for a terrible panic, the end of which I cannot see or even imagine. Abraham Lincoln was outraged, and his cabinet was very, very sad. Lincoln, after the seven days, said that the gloves are coming off. He's not going to mess around with the South anymore. Abraham Lincoln had been reading some writings by a famous abolitionist, a guy named Frederick Douglass. And Frederick Douglass had a very specific message for the president. Peace shall never be achieved until black men are admitted fully and completely into the body politic of America. In other words, the war is not going to end, Abe, until you try to free black people, get rid of this whole slavery nonsense, and have black people actually fight alongside white people to crush the Confederacy and end slavery once and for all. Initially, Abraham Lincoln was very, very reluctant to do this. He was afraid that if he did this, a lot of people in the North who supported slavery would try to secede as well. But after the Battle of Seven Days... He began to think that Douglas was right, and he started talking to his cabinet about writing some kind of proclamation that would free slaves, something called an Emancipation Proclamation. Abraham Lincoln thought to himself, man, we could really use the four million slaves down in the South to start fighting for us. That would really help us win this war. His Secretary of State at the time was a guy named William Seward. Seward had this to say to Lincoln, Lincoln, I agree with you, but I wouldn't deliver an emancipation proclamation until we win a battle. Otherwise, the rest of the world might view it as the last measure of an exhausted government, a cry for help, our last shriek on the retreat. In other words, Seward felt that if Lincoln issued an emancipation proclamation to free the slaves, it might look like the North was weak, like they were desperate, like they were losing the war. And so because of that, and so because of that, Abraham Lincoln did not want to issue the Emancipation Proclamation until he won a battle. He totally agreed with Seward at the time. So this is the goal. Abraham Lincoln's going to sit on his hands until the battle is won. Any battle is won. And then he might issue the Emancipation Proclamation. It didn't take him long for him to get a quote unquote victory. Because in the meantime, Robert E. Lee was thinking to himself, you know what? I'm going to invade the North. We need the British on our side. And if I invade the North, and if I beat the Union in their own ground, it's going to show how strong the Confederacy is. If I can prove to Europe that the Confederacy is a, a strong, strong country that is going to stand on its own, Britain will swoop to our aid because they need our cotton and we'll be saved. So this is Robert E. Lee's major gamble. It's hard to invade another country, but he gets his army together and they march north into the state of Maryland. This is a map showing Robert E. Lee's marching. He's the red arrows and the blue arrows are the Union forces. McClellan at this time is holed up near Washington, D.C., but as soon as he hears that um, Robert E. Lee is invading Maryland, he marches to the northwest to stop the invasion. And while McClellan's troops are marching to the northwest, lo and behold, something crazy happens. Nearby the town of Frederick, Maryland, one of McClellan's soldiers spots something on the ground. It's probably hard to tell what this is, but these are three cigars. And these cigars are wrapped up in a letter. This letter that that soldier found on the ground were um, McClellan's battle plans. And they said that Robert E. Lee was going to divide his army into four tiny, itty-bitty armies. This is great news for McClellan because McClellan could take his much larger army and crush Robert E. Lee's four smaller armies in one fell swoop. McClellan even recognized how huge of a development this was. He said, here is paper with which if I cannot whip Bobby Lee, I will be willing to go home. So what does George B. McClellan do once he gets the actual battle plans of Robert E. Lee? Well, he waits for 18 hours, giving Lee plenty of time to bring his forces together and form one big army again. 
The chance to destroy Lee's army once and for all is gone. Anyway, McClellan's forces meet up with Lee's forces in a city in Maryland. The city is called Sharpsburg, Maryland, and on September 17, 1862, a decisive battle is going to take place. Battle of Antietam. McClellan has 60,000 soldiers. Lee has 45,000 soldiers. And I'm going to tell you guys, this battle really featured some of the fiercest fighting in the war. One Union soldier said, The men are loading and firing with demoniacal fury and shouting and laughing hysterically. People basically lost their minds and went berserk fighting in the Battle of Antietam. It was furious, furious fighting. And as the day wore on after 12 hours, Lee was forced to stop. The guns silenced. Lee waited, almost daring McClellan to attack him. Robert E. Lee did not have any more troops in reserve. He did not have any folks who could um, support his really exhausted and ragtag army. McClellan had two fresh divisions that he could commit to battle at this time. And historians think that if McClellan did commit those two units to battle, he could have ended the war in 1862. This is his third chance to do so. What does McClellan do? Nothing. He waits, Robert E. Lee retreats, and lives to fight another day. But the invasion is stopped. The Battle of Antietam was incredibly deadly. 1,717 casualties existed in the Battle of Antietam. Now that's just a number until I put it in perspective, and I'm going to do so right now. That's four times more casualties than D-Day. Put another way. More Americans died in the Battle of Antietam than all the American casualties in the War of 1812, the Mexican-American War, and the Spanish-American War combined. This was September 17th, 1862, the bloodiest day in American history. And it wasn't just a very bloody battle. It was also a, a major turning point in the war. So, essential question number 13 asks, why was the Battle of Antietam such a major turning point in the conflict? And I'm going to give you three reasons why. First, Lincoln finally decides to get rid of McClellan. McClellan failed in the Seven Days Battle. He stopped Lee's advance in Antietam, but he failed to take the opportunity to finally crush Lee. And so he was out. Second, Britain has been standing on the sidelines this entire time thinking to itself, do we join the Confederacy? Do we support the Confederacy? Do we just stay out of this conflict altogether? After the Battle of Antietam, Britain says, we out. We're done. The Confederacy, it's too much of a risk. We're not going to get involved. Finally, this was the win that Abraham Lincoln needed in order to issue the Emancipation Proclamation. Tomorrow in class, we're going to read the Emancipation Proclamation. It's by far the most important decision that Abraham Lincoln ever made. He certainly felt so. Um, so I'm looking forward to that and I hope you are too. Thank you so much for listening and have a great day.